Uh, I just want to start by saying, Anne, right on. <laughs> oh, I just loved that. That was great. <laughs> and um, I'm going to talk about affordability and uh, what we're going to do with our existing buildings. Since I have such a short amount of time, I'm going to try to jam through all the slides. And if you could hold your questions until the end, I'm really hoping to set some time aside for questions. OK, so let's go. OK, so we're on to uh, the slide with the yellow states. So just a little bit about our company. We do um, consulting, and we help people figure out what their efficiency resource is and then how to develop programs to go after that efficiency resource. And although this shows that we're taking over the country, in fact, we're taking over the world. Mm -hmm. And just the countries I know of that we've worked with are Canada, China, and I know EU is not a country, but we've worked over there too. <laughs> uh, click. All right, so it's just a little bit of definitional stuff here at the beginning. It's really important to me that we figure out what to do with our existing buildings. Um, I live and work in Vermont, and the non-heating season is really only reliably like nine or 10 weeks out of the year. And even there, a zero energy home, so this is an existing building that's had a retrofit, that can be an economical thing to do. It can be lower, low enough cost to do the work and a high enough return in terms of energy savings that it makes sense to do it there. And if you live in a climate where it's either milder or um, your construction costs are, are lower, um, or the fuel prices are higher, or your regulations are even more favorable than they are in Vermont, then it's like hugely uh, beneficial to go in this direction. Um, and I really feel like, why would we do zero energy homes? Because we can. And there are so many benefits of doing it that that can be the motivator, and we can all just get the environmental benefits that ride along with it. Click, next slide. Okay, so again, we're still on definitional stuff here. So I'm just gonna tell you like what I'm talking about when I talk about zero energy homes. Um, it's, I'm talking about existing homes. It's really about making an investment in the building and that there will be a return on that investment. And I talk to people a lot about making that work happen as part of stuff that's already gonna happen in the home. And so you can see that none of this is about the environmental aspect or making an environmental pitch. This is really about um, motiv motivating people to do this by just having a more enjoyable house and then they get the zero energy piece with it. Okay, click to the next slide. Um, there are three pieces to creating a zero energy home and Anne just went over this. There's improvements to the building, electrification and the renewable energy, and then balancing all those well leads to the cost optimization that also Anne referred to. And that's, that's why I'm out there talking to people. I'm saying this is a better way to run your home. It saves you money and you, know, you can also have a renewed home as a result. Click to the next slide. So it's really important to me to um, make this manageable, right? Like I just think if you come into this and say, uh, you know, you have to cross the zero energy finish line or, you know, don't even talk to me, then that's very off-putting. Uh, I'm, I'm here to work on all the homes out there and I really don't spend a lot of time on large fancy homes. They're expensive to retrofit and there's no challenge in that for me. The challenge to me is finding the people who just stretch everything that they had to buy that $300,000 house and they don't feel like they can ever have any money to build themselves a new kitchen. But I come in and I say, you know, we can reduce your operating costs and thereby loosen up some cash to make this retrofit happen. And in the process, you're going to end up with a mudroom, which we all need in Vermont and New York, or you're going to end up with, you know, uh, more comfortable upstairs or whatever the case may be. Um, so I don't talk to people at all about payback. That is really a way to just be a bummer on the whole conversation and it's uh, very unmotivating, um, but it's, it can be affordable to do this. So, you know, I talk to people about how to make it, I, I talk to people about cash flow a lot, which more than payback. And there's a lot of benefits that come with this, but 
free is not one of them. You do need to be willing to pay for it. So um, I'm, I'm into like zero flavored. When, and since I have the talking stick right now, I'm gonna tell you what I think about zero energy. First of all, I never say net, just like simplify everything. It's just zero energy. And um, I love that Anne talked about, look, if you're close, we wanna know about it. That's important. Because the truth is, you know, something close to zero energy or heading towards zero energy, or I'll get there in 10 years, is way better than what most of us are doing now. And most of our clients, are doing nothing because they feel paralyzed about it or they think it's going to be too expensive um, or they just don't know how to do it. So I'm into zero-ish. That was quick. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> We're on to the 2014 and 2017 slide now. Um, so I had uh, two years in which I spent some time working on this. Uh, in 2014, my question was really, how do I get people to do more of this work? Uh, not zero. What I really wanted people to do was go big on the efficiency work in their homes. And I realized um, through sort of a bolt of lightning that zero energy was the way to get people to do that. So I went around the state and talked to hundreds of people about uh, doing it in their homes. Everybody that raised their hand and said, yeah, I want to do that. They got a, a lot of intensive support from me. I did technical trainings with builders. We had Peter Yost do an advanced building science course with our builders, and it was so much fun to just talk about the really most extreme of what we know how to do and how to do it well and safely. Um, I tried to support the market by offering free energy modeling, working with the supply chain to make sure we had the best products and at the cheapest price, and I you know, convened builders and tried to come up with these cost-optimized designs. Nobody wanted any of that stuff. Um, and in the end, people who crossed the finish line by the end of my study, which is just through 2014, they got an energy monitoring system in their home. And that stuff just was kind of abandoned for a few years until 2017 when I got some more funding to spend more time on this. And I was able to do monitoring in more homes. And my purpose there was really just to understand the cost. Um, so that was in 2017. And then the rest of this is gonna be about you know what I've learned through you know, looking at these turns out to just be 10 homes, which is, you know, Vermont, 10 homes was substantial, although I do recognize that this is a very small um, sample here. Um, so this first slide here, I thought would be kind of the money shot that everybody would want to know is, are, can homes in Vermont really make it to zero energy? And let me just say about California, I mean, I, I hope to sort of universalize this for other places um, in the country. But I just love that California has like basically every climate zone there is, um, with including the most mild climate in the continental US, mm -hmm. which is San Diego. And you know, up to like I used to go skiing in Mammoth, so that's even, I'm, it's not colder than Vermont, but it's a heck of a lot snowier. Um, so anyway, um, can you do it in Vermont? Which is a proxy for saying, can you do it anywhere? And this slide is showing the yellow is, um, the yellow is electricity. Yeah, I'm sorry, I can't see that. Maybe I could shrink this down over here. That's electricity consumed. Um, and the gray is biomass. So you can see a lot of folks here. That, and here, biomass is all cord wood. Um, you know, in other circumstances, of course, it could be lots of other things. And um, fossil. So most of all the ladder homes, so um, six, seven, eight, nine, and 10, they all have fossil backup. Um, which is, I mean, backup's not the right word. What they have is their, their pre-existing fossil systems. Um, only one of those homes, I think it's number nine, removed the fossil system from the house. So that's an all electric house. And, and, and then on the other side, the blue is the PV production. And you can see that there's one home that has no PV production. So again, love what you said, Anne, about, um, you know, we, zero energy ready is good enough. Uh, so, you know, no, they're not, they're not really zero. And let me just give you a caution about number 10 over there. This is one of my colleagues um, who has <laughs> um, been working on solar stuff for like decades. And um, he's like at a complete loss about why it is like this. And I can tell you why it is. And this is the caution. No, empty nester. I think it's one guy living in like a 2,800 square foot home. 
Um, it's the ca it's it's a caution about the halfway project, right? I'm I'm really I'm getting people on the path to zero energy, so I'm not you know I'm not the all or nothing, but there also are some stopping points that incur a lot of pain in terms of consumption. And he has done a lot of work on his house, but not the work that's really necessary to get over the hump and reap the benefits, which probably amounts to not enough work on the enclosure, so not enough building improvement. And he also has systems where the efficiency goes way, way down the less he uses them. So an old oil boiler is like high mass, and the less you use it, the more it just sits around keeping itself hot. So a lot of fuel consumption, but he's also at the same time using this heat pumps and burning wood while he's not using his boiler that's just keeping itself warm. So that's the cautions about the halfway project. Um, so the people with um, fossil supplement are really reluctant to use it, but the people with wood as their other heat use it quite a bit. And there are three homes here that are all electric and they're all doing great. And this really this chart is about um, how much solar can you get? And so the answer is, are they zero? Well, tell me how much solar you can get. So how much solar people have is highly dependent on um, the regulatory environment. You know, so there are some parts of the country where like you just can't net meter in any kind of good cost effective way, right? Like they'll pay you two or three cents a kilowatt hour. And you know, that's not gonna encourage a lot of people to do it. Um, in Vermont, we had for a long time a great situation where not only were we like full net metered, but there was a feed-in tariff of six cents. So you were making six cents cash for every kilowatt hour that you netted and, and beyond. Everything that you used and didn't use, you still got six cents on it. So it was a money maker, and it actually made it not beneficial to try to zero out your energy because then you were just generating all this credit on your bill that you know eventually just donated to the utility. So these guys like um, number uh, one, two, three, four, number four, like that's perfect. You know, that's that's almost zero, a little bit low. That's great. They probably only donated a little bit to the utility. You know, number eight, they're doing great. Um, and then there's number two, and he had this whole plan to do group net meter and he was going to sell it to his neighbors. That's why he has such a big solar array. He needs oh. an electric car. He needs an electric car. He, he did get one eventually. I drove up there in my leaf and parked it next to his leaf. <laughs> And he let me he let me charge. Okay, so we're going on to the next one. I'm gonna try. There we go. The squiggly one. Are are the homes comfortable? So um, this is this is five sites all piled on top of each other. And the the heavy black line that, that goes across that's two degrees temperature difference between the like probably the living room is where that temperature sensor is and a bedroom. Oftentimes it's the master bedroom, but you know, depending on where we can run wires to, it might be a different bedroom. So we're looking at the temperature difference between the core of the house and a more, you know, the extremities of the house. And in the, I guess this is just the heating season here, but if you look at the really cold part of the heating season, like in the middle, all those bar, all those lines are above the two degree bar. Now the two degree bar is like a very arbitrary, that's just, you know, and I think, Maybe in Asher it says like you're trying to keep the whole house two, within two degrees of the set point, and that's considered comfortable. Um, so, you know, what I wanted to say about this is that um, it's people who do this at this point are highly tolerant of this variability. Um, it, that is that will not always be the case, and this problem here might turn out to be an obstacle to. Uh, more doing more of these projects. Um, this is also well. Uh, we haven't gone to the technologies part yet, but these people are all doing point source heating, so they're doing mini splits, mini split heat pumps, and so that's why they have to, you know, have one room that's warmer than another because they're overheating the room with the mini split. Um, this also is kind of the way that we all lived when we were heating our houses with wood. So it's it's not that it's not that different. And people actually report that they're happy to have the bedroom be a little bit cooler than everything else that helps them sleep. Now, I always thought that that was maybe like just uh, New Englanders being frugal and saying that they can put up with snow in the bedroom. But, uh, you know, recently I like read this thing about how this is how your body gets signaled that it's time to go to sleep is that the temperature starts to drop. So uh, <laughs> I believe it. And the main story here is that people, nobody, I went back and interviewed everybody about how happy they were with their 
zero energy retrofit, nobody mentioned comfort as a problem. In fact, most people had improved comfort because of the envelope work that was done. Okay, are the homes healthy? Um, this is just one home, and there's a bunch of lines on here. Some of them are temperature, uh, but the purple one is carbon dioxide in the bedroom. And this home, so over on the right side is parts per million carbon dioxide, and 1,000 parts per million is the third number down. So anything above that point is, you know, can be considered unhealthy. I mean, you can choose, like, your threshold. We just talked about 1,000 parts per million as being, like, you know, that's our, that's our threshold. And, you know, based on um, some studies that we've been doing and also this growing body of evidence about cognitive decline with increased levels of carbon dioxide, I really have um, come to feel like you just need this. So I, I'm sorry, I'm clicking without telling everybody, but I'm now on the second slide that says our home's healthy. And um, so this is a home with an advanced ventilation system. And you can see that the purple line spends most of its time under the thousand mark. And I just come to believe that all of these homes need an advanced ventilation system. Now, in some climates that might mean, well, so advanced ventilation is continuous and filtered and distributed all over the house. If you have big loads like uh, you know heating or cooling load or dehumidification, then you need to have energy recovery as well. But you know, just fundamentally, you need to put fresh air where the people are, and it needs to be going on all the time. So this now is part of what I define as like a good zero energy project. Click. Okay, so how much conservation is required? This is the question of how much work do you need to do on the building itself? So yes? Real, real quick, yeah. Jaylen, how are you doing that affordably? The previous slide. Yeah, how are you bringing the ventilation in affordably? Um, well, so small homes, um, single story homes are easy. You know, if, if they're, we have a lot of basements. But you know you have crawl spaces and crawl spaces are possible. Also, you have attics that you could recruit. And I'll, there's a technology that I'll get to later on that maybe can help with that. Um, so we'll, we'll get back to that. Uh, so how much conservation needs to happen? And um, I, you know, I was involved. The first five projects, one through five, those are the ones that got like a lot of intensive support from me. And the other ones, I was not involved in the project until the end when I just came through and did the monitoring. And then um, you can see number 10 is my colleague that's like using too much energy. But but the last bar is the Vermont average. So, you know, that yeah, this is really working here. But I can what I find really interesting about this slide is that um, that with the first five, you can kind of see that there's like maybe maybe we could pick a number. Maybe uh, 15,000 BTUs per square foot per year is about where we need to be aiming our building improvement efforts. Now, maybe it's climate specific, but maybe it's not, right? Because it's like easier to get to 15,000 BT, uh, uh, yeah, 15, BTUs per square foot per year in California or in Arizona or whatever. So I think that's really interesting that th this is starting to point to metrics for some future definition of zero energy. Can you, can you define what all else means? And is that Everything, including fuel. So this is, I changed units on you here. The other one was, um, it was in kilowatt hours, and this is in BTUs. Um, but this is like, we converted the fuels to BTUs. And so that's all the energy use in the house, of everything. It's five a particularly small house. Um, no. That house, oh, that house is the one that doesn't have solar, and they are burning a lot, a lot, a lot of wood, and the efficient, the poor efficiency of cordwood burning is what I think is leading to that. Do you uh, equalize in some way uh, combustion fuels versus electricity? Is there any multiplier that you use, or you just have No, just right. Direct? It's not, it's just like what they consume. So no multipliers. Okay, so now we're going on to the technologies. So um, everybody did something like totally different from their house. And, and one of the things that we really need to get to is a more, somebody was talking about, talking about Linda Wigington yesterday. I love Linda. She has this term, widgetization. 
And we just need to get to the point where this is more widgetized. So they cannot be these bespoke custom projects for each house because we're just not going to get to enough houses fast enough doing that. So, um, so this is like one house that did basically they did a deep energy retrofit. But you know, like in Vermont, they put a lot of insulation on the outside of the house. They air sealed the snot out of it. Um, this both pictures are the same house. Can you guys see what's going on with the picture on the right? See that left framing there? Why is there a framing sticking out there? Because you're thickening out the wall and you need the roof to cover the new thickened wall. Right, so this is the kind of thing that's required. Look, in some places, um, you might, yeah, so people are staying at the uh, the hotel, uh, hotel Arcada, there's a little sign next to the radiator that says, don't touch the radiator, and if it gets too hot, open a window. Um, <laughs> Um, <laughs> double hung thermostat. Double hung thermostat. So, um, you know, look, in some places, this could just be like um, storm windows and treat the attic real good. So it, it's like all over the map what you can do here. Um, and it's really very climate specific. It's, it's a, this is a very expensive, complicated piece in Vermont, but in other places, it may not be. Um, okay, so the heating and cooling, where everybody in my study did cold climate heat pumps, in um, the, the, these are expensive kind of doodads, they're like five, four or five thousand dollars, but um, in other climates, like you can do a cheaper version of this because it doesn't have to be so high performing. And in the Northeast, the we it's Hydronics Valley or Hydronics, whatever the region there, we have lots of um, hot water heat. And so what's very promising sort of coming around the bend now is um, split air to water heat pumps that we can use our existing distribution. So the baseboard or the radiators, we can use that with, um, with heat pumps. And then, um, so lots of homes just had one in the whole house. And this is, leads to the cold bedroom thing, but it also sort of shows you the potential for cost optimization. Because if you do enough envelope work, you can just do, you know, a little bit of on the mechanical side. Oh, water heating, very difficult. Very difficult to figure out the water heating. In many homes, this is getting to be the biggest load. And uh, I say here that a basement is required for a heat pump water heater. Um, it's not really required. And as I was walking around early this morning, looking at all the houses around here, I just thought, you know, it's not really a basement that's required, but it's a place that doesn't get cold and also, where the heat pump water heater, which is noisy and is basically an air conditioner year round, where that's not gonna bother people. And so, yeah, maybe a garage, maybe, um, but uh, like where to put that is really a big problem. So I'm, I like really don't know where we're going to heat pump hot water. There are these split heat pump water heaters where you put all the noise and all the air conditioning effect, you put that outside. Um, I don't feel like it's ready for prime time yet, or at least it's not coming to Vermont yet. Oh, so water conservation like really, really helps everything on this score. So um, drain water heat recovery, people know about that. It's this cool like copper stack where they use um, just really passive, straightforward heat exchange to strip energy out of your shallow water before it goes into the... Into the click, yes. Thank you. Okay, we're on to ventilation. So here we come back to the question about how to do this effectively or, or cost effectively, low cost, affordably. So um, uh, here are the, my three things that I want, continuous and distributed and filtered. And if it's hot or cold or humid, you need uh, energy recovery with that. It is really hard to do duct work in existing buildings. Um, these, and, and also I should just say about, you know, this, there aren't very many products that are truly efficient. So we need the electrical side to not just take over everything, the fans and whatnot. Um, so this is two products that, that can fit the bill, they're very efficient. But the fact that the ductwork can be challenging in multi-story homes, maybe, quick, thank you. We're on to the next one, the technologies. Uh, the Lunos is a product that has everything you need, the heat exchange and the fan, all in a core that just goes pop into the wall. So there's no duct work. Um, you have to buy a whole bunch of these for the house, right? Because it needs to be like one in every bedroom and one in the living room. And, um, so it's not 
It's not cheap, but you don't have to do duct work. So I, my answer to this question about how do you do it affordably is you just have to commit to doing it. Don't think of it as optional. You really can't say like, well, you know, I don't care that we don't, none of us have allergies, so we're not going to do that. Ah, uh, no, you know, we can't afford to do all this work in a building and then leave it as an unhealthy building. Like if that's what you're going to do, I'd say just stay home. Um, I'm going to skip right over the solar part because we all know a lot about solar. Um, Anne? <laughs> How much do those cost? They're like $1,100 a pair and you have to get electrical to it. So even though it's like pop goes right in the wall, you do have to, get the electricity there. Okay, so I have all these things about like what, how, my advice about how to make more of this happen. Um, there's, it's, I sort of break it out like there's just the background work that we all need to be involved in. Make sure that the regulations are good and solid and favor um, the consumer. All kinds of things around that like, you know, batteries and demand charges and what all. Um, we're doing work on the real estate valuation. There's the screen and energy efficient addendum, which the, um, the appraisers use, and, and we all should get familiar with that and promote it um, so that people can have um, home value that's like equal to the investment that they've made in their home. And we need to help people really understand like what we're talking about here when we say let's make an investment in your home. Um, quick. <laughs> Thank you. Um, let's see. Uh, this is, time, so. yeah, this is, our, this is on the program side of things, and I'm just going to skip over that one. Please. Click. This is about you and making decisions in your home and your town. Um, like, influence the influencers. And anybody who takes this on really needs to be prepared to stage this. It's not going to happen all at once. These are just too big of projects, and we're all living in our homes in the meantime. Click. And then, finally, this is, um, like, my idea of how to really get people on the path. So this is like four colorful circles. Um, the plan is the essential part. And once you have a plan, it's really easy to make sure that you don't start doing stuff that like gets you off the path. And the plan is work that you already have to do in your house, you know, replace the roof, stuff like that. Work that you're going to do in your house. Uh, you know, the, the, I really hate how the back bedroom is so small and I'm going to you know, bump out the back of the house. That stuff all is like these great opportunities to advance down the path to zero energy. Um, know where you're going. Some people, it's not going to be all the way to zero. It's just not. Some people, especially in Vermont, want to burn wood, and they're just happy doing that. So their their destination of zero energy is like different than mine or other people's. Just know where you're going, and then find the least cost way to get there. And once you have all those pieces in place, you're not going to wander off the path and discover that you've spent thirty thousand dollars. And not and made it even harder to get to zero energy. And that is the end of mine. So Woo! <laughs>